were in verse 7 in the church of Philadelphia this week as we, as we continue on. And <clears throat> I don't know how the rest of the study is going to be in Revelation as we actually get to more of the tribulation and those things. But uh, at least for me personally, studying these seven churches have been a, a real blessing. And certainly this is the, not the exception. This is the, this is the church that everybody prays their church will be, is the, is the church of uh, uh, Philadelphia, as we look at the commendations as well as the condemnations to these various churches and what Jesus has to say about them. And again, we're reminded of the fact that they were seven actual churches in, in Asia Minor or Western Turkey. Uh, there were many other churches, and as we've seen every week, and we'll see with this church, Jesus picks these seven for a particular reason something about that city its history, its culture, <clears throat> something about the church there in particular that he uses to express a concern not only for that church, but all the churches in the first century. And certainly it's very clear. We've tried to make the case that it's for all the churches uh, of all history. And we've certainly seen that application as we've gone through it uh, week by week. Well, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll jump in. Father, we do ask you to now, bless our time in, in your word as we look at this, <clears throat> this uh, church that is such a tremendous model, and we pray that we could be uh, a, a church of Philadelphia, a church of not just uh, in name of brotherly love, but because uh, you had opened a door for them, an effective door through which they were able to walk and, uh, and take the gospel into uh, other languages and other cultures. Uh, they were also a church, Lord, that... Um, we feel that we're in and that you've given a, a promise that uh, the church will be removed before uh, the great tribulation comes. So uh, we just pray there'd be so many things that would uh, uh, be meaningful to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, a couple of uh, background, and we showed a little video of the, uh, the church of Sardis um, uh, last week. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it is a beautiful countryside. I wanted you to see a little bit of the video. This particular church uh, laid on <clears throat> very important trade routes during the uh, Byzantine period. It was the, the most important trade route, and basically on the most important trade route uh, in, in that part of the world. Uh, we're familiar with our own Philadelphia, and we know that that word means brotherly love. It is traced back to this city. Uh, the name comes from two brothers, a king, Attalus of Pergama, who sponsored the founding of the city on behalf of his brother, King Eumenes. So one king uh, to the other king, their brothers, brotherly love. So that's the idea of, of where the name comes from. Uh, and again, the original uh, purpose and what this particular city was known for was the fact that it exported to the rest of the Roman world and beyond the Greek culture and the Greek, uh, Greek language. And um, it was so successful in that that uh, the previous language by 20 AD was no longer even spoken uh, and they spoke only Greek there. Uh, it was said that this, church, this city had an open door through which the spread of the Greek culture could go to the rest of the world. And of course, that's a phrase that Jesus is going to use. It would be meaningful to them. They understood this idea of having a, an open door to, to basically take what they loved and what they knew in terms of the Greek language and culture and take it to other places. So Jesus, again, picks this particular city to talk about this particular church in a type of church that sees before it an open door uh, that they can then obviously take, take the gospel to other places. Uh, it's a city that, uh, at least we know from uh, archaeological digs and from history, was prone to uh, natural disaster and an earthquake in 17 AD, devastated Sardis and also hit Philadelphia. And there were several uh, aftershocks for a number of years, which, uh, again, historically we know brought about a general sense of a panic if you had a major earthquake and a lot of destruction and then every couple of months it just kind of shook again it would literally shake you emotionally uh, we find that to be the case to, in many places around the world today the roman senate decides to help finance the rebuilding of the of the city uh, and so when they rebuild it they give it a new name and we're going to talk about new names in our text as well uh, because, uh, again, Rome rebuilds the city of Philadelphia after this earthquake. They name it Neo-Caesar, or the new city of Caesar. And, of course, Jesus is uh, 
The name never caught on, by the way, but they're very familiar with what transpired here in this church and this city, and Jesus is going to have a lot to say about the fact that he's going to give us a new name. Again, so many things that happen here historically, culturally, historically, uh, there's a reason why Jesus picks this particular uh, city. And again, it's in verse 12 that we'll see that uh, uh, in terms of future compensations, we're going to... Uh, have a new name. Philadelphia is also known for its resistance to the Muslim influence all the way through the, uh, the Middle Ages. As you can imagine, all of Turkey today is predominantly Muslim, although there are remnants of, uh, of, um, uh, of Christianity that, uh, that, is, uh, that are there. And um, uh, one of the folks in the church, their daughter has been doing outreach in Turkey uh, this last summer with Campus Crusade. And uh, in, in Western Turkey, there, there are Christians. Most of the, the Jews that live there have been, like other uh, countries in the Middle East, have been driven out uh, over the years. But uh, it was known as a, as a place that uh, resisted the Muslim influence all the way through the, uh, the Middle Ages. And um, again, so it was uh, uh, talked about the fact that uh, uh, they had this resistance and they were able to, to stand firm. Arthur Gibeon, in his... Uh, kind of five-volume classic work, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, speaks about this city as being a standing pillar to the resistance of Islam. And we're going to have that phrase mentioned uh, in our text as, as well. Jesus compares these believers to being in the end in terms of a compensation at the end uh, as like standing pillars. And uh, again, we also note that this city, there are no condemnations. There's nothing that Jesus condemns this city uh, over. Let's go and take a look at, uh, uh, at this particular city in this text, verse 7. And to the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship or bow before your feet and know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial uh, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He was an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So following the, the best we can, some of the outlines of the other churches, we note first that Jesus communicates his message in verse 7 and 8. And the first thing he communicates is the fact that he is, uh, he is holy and true. And uh, uh, this means that his, his words can be trusted. It's not even in the character of God or possible for God to, uh, to ever lie. So every promise that God ever makes will always absolutely uh, come true because he is holy and he is true. Therefore, he is totally reliable. And, uh, and again, as we saw and we'll see later in chapter 6, those that are martyred for their faith during the tribulation, the Lord uses a similar language to them. There in verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 10, it says, And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true? until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. In other words, you're holy and true, and we can count on you. You're reliable. We know you're going to be the right thing. We're looking for some kind of justification as to what's going on here, Lord. So we cry out to you because you're holy and true. You're reliable. We can trust you. Uh, there's a lot of things that uh, don't always go right in our life, but there's something we can always be thankful for in the fact that God is holy and true, which also means he's not like us. He's holy. He's completely other. Uh, he's not like us uh, or, or uh, anything like us. Uh, his word and as a person, he is completely reliable. 
And again, this is a, a church that was known for the fact that they held on uh, uh, against great resistance. And there's nothing bad that Jesus has to say about them. And so every, we want to learn everything we can about this church. And one of the things we first learn is that what they thought of and what Jesus reminds them is the fact that he is holy and true. You can count on me and I am completely reliable. Uh, and if we're going to be a church like Philadelphia, we have to realize that as well. The second thing is very interesting. He communicates that he holds the key of David, which uh, he makes reference to the fact that uh, uh, what he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. And this is pretty much a, a, a direct uh, quotation from Isaiah 22. And uh, I'll read the, the whole thing for you. But it, again, it's uh, Isaiah is talking about one day the Messiah will come, the son of David, and he will sit on his throne in Jerusalem and rule forever and ever, and it'll be a glorious thing. That's the context here. Uh, Isaiah 22, 20. Then it shall be in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of uh, Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and strengthen him with your belt. I will commit your responsibility into his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, the key of the house of David. There's our quote. I will lay on his shoulder. He shall open and no one shall shut. He shall shut and no one shall open. I will fasten him, the Messiah, as a peg in a secure place. And he will become uh, a glorious throne to his father's house. They will hang on him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the posterity, all vessels of small quantity from the cups to all the pitchers. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, the peg that is fastened in the secure place will be removed and cut down and fall, and the burden that was on it will be cut off for the Lord has spoken. Uh, it would take us a long time to digress everything that that passage says, but basically it's talking about the fact that the Messiah is going to come uh, and he's going to rule and he's going to reign. He is the key of David. Jesus is the key of David, is what Isaiah is saying. And that's what's being made reference uh, uh, to in our text. But you'll notice also that at the end of verse 25, Isaiah even talks about when the Messiah comes, he's going to be cut off. And talking about, again, the, the uh, rejection of the Messiah the first time uh, and his, uh, his crucifixion uh, there. But again, uh, the key of David here really means, uh, uh, he's talking about the Messiah. Uh, the metaphor is uh, Jesus uses in Matthew 16, 19. We're more familiar with that passage. Jesus says to Peter, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So again, keys are, they open the door. They get you in. You got the key. You've got the, uh, the authority to, to op some, open something up or to close something. Uh, and again, Jesus has that authority. And he gives to Peter then, in the metaphor, the keys, a sense of authority. What's that authority for? It's for taking the, the gospel into the world. And again, it's Peter then that basically bridges that gap from a completely Jewish work initially of the Holy Spirit in terms of the life of the church. It's Peter that goes to the, the house of Cornelius, preaches the gospel, and we have the first Gentiles, again, Cornelius being a Roman a centurion and all those in his household that he had gathered. They hear the gospel and they have the same experience that we see with uh, the Jews there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Peter is given the keys, this authority, and God opens a door for him to take the gospel to, uh, to the Gentiles. So again, the, the key of David literally is the Messiah or, or Jesus. The third thing that uh, Jesus communicates to this church, and we'll get back to this idea of a door that's open uh, here in a moment, but Jesus communicates a challenge, and that's in verse 8. I know your works. See, I've set before you an open door and no one can shut it. So as we've already mentioned, it's really a challenge. He's communicating something, but he's communicating a challenge to spread the gospel, to send missionaries out. You're a city that's known for spreading something, Greek culture and Greek language, and you've been very good at it. In terms of the Roman world, it's been an open door for you, but you guys in that city, aware of this, here's what I want you to do. 
I've given you myself, and I've given you a key, and I've given you authority, and I'm going to open doors for you to take the gospel to places it's never gone before. Therefore, we talk about this being a missionary sending kind of a church. Now, I want to read uh, so that we really understand this a little better. A passage from um, Paul in 1 Corinthians 16, 8. He there talks about an, a, a door that the Lord has opened for him as well, that we don't misunderstand what the Lord's saying. There it says, but Paul's saying, but I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost for a great and effective door has been opened to me and there are many adversaries. See, two things to notice is that the door is effective. Paul can get through it and be very effective in sharing the gospel, of having men and women and children come to faith in Jesus Christ as he continues on in his missionary efforts. But at the same time, it doesn't mean there won't be adversaries. It doesn't mean that we walk through the door and if we get a little resistance, it's like, well, that wasn't the Lord. I'm out of here. That's, that's, that's not the idea. Uh, of course, sometimes we could be guilty of trying to kick down doors that God never meant to open as well. But when the Lord opens a door, it will be effective. But it, it doesn't mean there won't be adversaries. It doesn't mean there won't be resistance to what's, uh, to what's going on here. And, uh, and we thank the Lord for the, door, the doors that uh, uh, the Lord has opened. The Lord has opened a door to China. And uh, Frank and Lee Chu walk, walk through that door and are able to be there and share, share the gospel. Uh, we, and there are just some, uh, so many people uh, have gone to China now. We love going there and uh, assisting what we can with the house church and taking the materials and so forth. And we do that because it's an open door. And, uh, and God is working and God is moving. And, and really, uh, tremendous numbers is just unbelievable. There's more, there's more Christians in China than any, than any other place in, in the world. And of course, our Chinese friends there like to tell us, and God loves the Chinese more than anyone else. Other, otherwise, he would not have made so many. <laughs> because there's Chinese everywhere. Everywhere you go in the world, there's a Chinese community some, somewhere. And, uh, but it's an open door. I love going to to India because uh, it's such an open door to the, to the gospel and going out with uh, some of the students from the Gospel for Asia training centers and going out and uh, just preaching the, the, the gospel at places. We're, we're there primarily to train these guys, uh, but in their training, they, they're actively going out and ministering and handing out tracts and, uh, and sharing the gospel. And uh, we were there, I was there on one trip and and uh, there were actually a, a group of churches uh, in a village came together, and they had actually sponsored a couple of Western guys to, uh, to come and do some evangelistic meetings. And I guess they had trouble with their, uh, it wasn't quite an open door for them. They had trouble with their visas and uh, didn't get there. So Mike Stengel and I were in the vicinity. So you're Western guys. How about, <laughs> they won't know the difference. Come over and uh, preach in these uh, meetings in the evening and stuff, which we were thrilled to do. I mean, it's great being in the schools, training everybody, but it was, uh, it was, uh, we, we love getting out into a little village. And, you know, if you set up some fluorescent lights and, and you have some, uh, you know, some amps and, uh, and some music and you put up a stage, you know, it's like, should we go light the candle in our mud hut or should we <laughs> go down to where all the, the action is? So, I mean, they just do that when there's like, you know, uh, 250 people show up, you know, the first night just to see what's, what's going on. Primarily, like 95% all Hindu, non-Christians, uh, there to hear the gospel. It was amazing just to share our testimony and freely share the gospel to this crowd and just see a, a tremendous response. Yes, people get actually saved when I preach the gospel in India. It's, it's, it's a tremendous thing. I love going there. <laughs> it's amazing, just the response. It's just such an open door to see people actually forsake a religion they've been brought up in their entire lives. And on the moment, hearing the gospel res respond and come forward, wipe the chalk chark mocks off their forehead, take their little gods out of their pockets, throw them up on the stage. And some of the guys there actually would stomp on them to prove to them, you no longer have to live in fear under these demigods and those that have held control over you your whole life because now Jesus is your savior and he's the king and he's the only one worthy of, uh, of being worshiped. Uh, it's an open door. It's, uh, it's exciting to, be, uh, to see it. We don't often see that kind of responses really, really here in the islands, but that's what we pray for. 
We pray for an open door, certainly, in people's hearts. And we want to continue to pray for an open door in terms of the gospel going into uh, other cultures and, and other countries. Secondly, Jesus, he not only communicates uh, this message to this very important church and city, he seeks to give them courage uh, to do so. And we saw that in verses 8 to 10. Uh, and really, there's five things that he mentions to give them courage. And the first one, he seeks to encourage them because they are dependent upon him. Notice he says, you have little strength. And by the way, that's a good thing. I mean, when we're really going to be used of the Lord, it's only because we come to the realization that we really can't do it our own. In fact, we can't do anything. Remember, Jesus says in John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, you know, uh, you know that, that's how you're going to produce fruit. And he says, apart from me, you can do nada. You can do, do nothing. Uh, it's the apostle Paul that says, it's when I'm weak that I'm strong. So what do we learn about this church if we want to be a, a Philadelphia kind of church? We must do everything that we do in the, in the name of, of, uh, of serving Jesus Christ, totally dependent upon him and the strength that he gives us by the grace that he sustains us, not because we've got it all figured out. We know how to do it. And we can rely upon our own methods and so forth. And Jesus actually encourages them in that, the fact that they have little strength. Secondly, he seeks to encourage them because they've kept his word. They've guarded the word of God, and, uh, and he commends them for it. Obviously, they've been uh, loyal to it, prove, using it to prove the validity of their own faith and uh, their love of Jesus Christ, uh, holding to the word of God. The third thing, Jesus seeks to encourage them because they have not denied his name. And uh, loyal to the name means loyal to the, the character of uh, of, of the name as well. And again, it's one of those things in the day in which we live now is that uh, if you hold to this idea of the name of Jesus Christ, who he is, his character, that he is God come in the flesh, you will be persecuted. Uh, there's a lot of people that will accept you if he's a God among other gods, if he's a son of God, just like there are many sons of God. Uh, if you can water it down and not hold to the word of God and not hold to the name of Jesus Christ, which is the only way in which we can be saved. If someone does not believe that Jesus is Lord, that he is God come in the flesh, it doesn't matter where they go to church, what they do, or whatever good works they've done, how generous they are, it means nothing. They're not saved. There's only one name under heaven whereby, Peter says, we must be saved. And it's the name of Jesus Christ. It's an issue. But these guys held fast, and Jesus encourages them right on. You know, uh, you do that, and I'm going to put an effective door before you, regardless of what the circumstance look around you. And again, we've, we've looked at these cities and where they lived. It was not an easy place to be a Christian. I didn't go through the various temples and the popular religions, but they had everything that all the other cities had as well uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the Greek and the Roman temples that were there. It was a tough place, but he encourages them. Thirdly, he seeks to encourage them because they, uh, again, haven't denied his name. And then fourth, he encourages them by telling them of the future outcome of their persecutors. I, I find this interesting. Verse 9, they will fall at your feet and acknowledge that I, that I love, have loved you. Uh, he says, you know, there are those that are persecuting you that pretend, pretend to be believers. They, they pretend that they're Jews. Uh, he says they're not. They're not believers. They don't believe in the Messiah. Uh, they're lying to you. Uh, and he says, and they're persecuting you. And they're, they're saying you don't have to, to be so strict when it comes to the word of God and, uh, and so forth. And you're being persecuted by them. He says, but in the future, there's going to come a time when they will actually bow at your feet. And Jesus will acknowledge before them, I love them because of what they did, because they held to my word. You know, there's just so many things in, in these seven churches. We, it would just be a powerful study just to, to take the, he who overcomes, this is what I'm going to do for you. I mean, because every week at the end, it's just been uh, so, so precious, and it will continue to be. But again, 
incredible words from Jesus to those that, that face so much in their, in their daily life in terms of uh, walking with the Lord. Uh, and again, very clear from the text that uh, when he says, uh, not all that say they are Jews are, are at all, but again, it's the idea that, in fact, there's the pretenders that are out there that are actually part of the, uh, the persecution that's, that's going on. Uh, one little passage from Isaiah, because uh, the same idea is there, this idea that one day unbelievers who's been hostile to us will actually bow at our, our feet. I don't know that we... If you ever had someone bow at your feet, it's not a real comfortable thing. And I don't think that we're all longing for this in any way. But uh, uh, yet at the same time, very interesting what, how this whole thing is going to get flipped around in the end. Isaiah 43, 2, Isaiah writing again says, When you pass through the waters, uh, I will be with you. Great passage of comfort here. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave you Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored and I have loved you. And, uh, and we'll, we'll experience that same kind of thing one day with the Lord. For, fifth thing, he encourages them by telling them, they're spared from the trial that is coming. Verse 10, uh, very uh, important verse for us, I believe. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from uh, the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So uh, verse 10, something's a, a great trial that's going to come upon the whole world. And it doesn't take a lot of speculation that there's only one great trial that's going to come upon the entire world at one time, and it's, it's what we're about ready to study about in the book of Revelation known as uh, the Great Tribulation. Now, again, there's two views as we, as we look. Well, actually, there's a, there's a couple of views of, of this idea of the tribulation, this seven-year period that we're about ready to study that John gives great detail. Uh, we hold the view that the church will be removed from planet Earth in what we call the rapture prior to that tribulation happening. That's what he's, he's saying here. There are others that believe that somehow in the middle of the tribulation and three and a half years in, they would be mid-tribulationists. That's when the rapture will occur. And there are others that believe they're post, that it's going to happen after the great, uh, great tribulation. Those that hold that view like to quote John 17, 15, where Jesus says, I do not pray that you should be, that you should, uh, be taken, taken them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil world, the evil one. So uh, the post-tribulation guy says, see, Jesus say, is praying in John 17. He's not praying that we'll be taken out of the world. He's just praying that we'll be protected uh, during, the, during the midst of it. And they, they love to look at that verse and, and others. But I want to go through uh, several things just in this text. And one of the things about studying Revelation is that we'll see over and over and over again uh, references to the fact that the church is not there on the earth during the tribulation. We're actually in heaven around the throne of God. But just in this text alone, verse 10, when Jesus says, keep you from, uh, means out of. It doesn't mean help you bear up under. It means you'll be removed. Uh, secondly, uh, the definite article, the, which we kind of lose in English, appears in the Greek in front of the hour and the trial. Uh, I will keep you uh, from the great trial that's coming on the earth. Uh, and, uh, and again, so there's an emphasis that we miss uh, in the uh, English that's there in the Greek. Uh, the hour and the trial we're going to be removed from. Uh, the third thing is the trial comes, as I mentioned, on the whole world. And that phrase is only used uh, to describe the tribulation period. For the purpose will be to test those who live on the earth. Uh, the phrase, those who live on the earth, is used ten times, always of unbelievers. The purpose of the tribulation is, again, God basically sending his judgment against a Christ-rejecting world. Uh, and uh, that's what's being discussed here. The fifth thing is that Gentile believers, those who get saved during the Great Tribulation, are not protected but are martyred for their faith. So this idea that somehow 
of the John 17, you know, uh, you know, he's somehow Jesus is going to protect believers during the tribulation period just is not true. It's not there in the text. If, if you're a Gentile and during this horrific period of time, the seven year period of time of judgment, if you become a Christian at that point, you will be martyred for, for your faith. Now we'll see that over and over again in the book of Revelation, but just to give you a couple of, uh, of verses. Uh, verse 7 of chapter 13, uh, basically talking about the uh, Antichrist, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Uh, later down in verse 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, again the Antichrist, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship, uh, and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. You either worship the beast or you're killed. Uh, and, and we could go on and on. There's, a, there's lots of other references. But the bottom, again, the bottom line, if you're a Gentile during the tribulation period, and there will be many that will come to faith in Jesus Christ. There will, there will be a, a multitude. And, but when they do, they will be martyred for, for their faith. The suggestion, get saved now. <laughs> Don't wait till, till then. Uh, but there will be a multitude of Gentile believers. Jews fall in a different category. During the tribulation period, two-thirds of them will be totally wiped out. There will be one-third of them uh, that will be spared. They are the remnant that cries out, and God protects them supernaturally. And they are the remnant in Revelation 19 that cries out to recognize Jesus is the Messiah. He is their Messiah. And he had said, uh, you will not see me as a nation, as a people, again, until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And uh, they cry out that he is the Messiah. He returns. That's what brings Jesus Christ back to planet Earth with the church uh, there in Revelation 19 uh, is to save them and, of course, uh, save them from their sins. There is also, we'll see uh, in our study, 144,000 Jews that are protected 12,000 from each tribe that basically are 144,000 Jewish Billy Grahams <clears throat> that are sent out into all the world preaching the gospel, and they are supernaturally protected. So there's a remnant of the Jews that are supernaturally protected during the tribulation period. There's 144,000 Jews that are all evangelists called by God, sealed and protected by him. The Antichrist will not be able to harm them. That'd be a little frustrating, I'm sure. Uh, and they'll be out sharing the gospel as well. But that's not true of Gentile believers that get saved during the tribulation period. So Jesus says to really us here in verse 10, uh, to the church, that there is going to come the trial that's going to come on the whole world. But I'm going to remove you and take you out before uh, it actually takes place. And again, Paul speaks of this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So again, notice that um, uh, no Gentiles will be alive on the earth when they, uh, uh, in, during the tribulation period. So uh, we who are alive and remain, therefore, this has got to take place prior to the tribulation period. So we'll continue to see uh, mounting uh, evidence for this idea of a pre-tribulation rapture. So Trying to keep everybody, some of you uh, could explain this better than me, and some of you this is all new information, so we'll kind of keep going through it. But uh, this is all meant to be an encouragement. Uh, he communicates this message that I've opened uh, a door for you. Uh, your, your city is known for exporting the Greek culture. Uh, your church is known for, a church like this church is known for exporting the, the gospel. And it's into places where I've opened the door. And if I've opened the door, no one's going to shut it. And, and again, that's, that's meant to be a tremendous uh, challenge as well as a tremendous uh, encouragement. Uh, and, uh, and again, 
he continues now with, with the challenge for them to be committed in verse 11. Why should we be committed in difficult times? Well, verse 11, he says, he's coming soon. Behold, I am coming quickly. Now, sometimes when Jesus is said, talking about coming quickly, it's to bring judgment. We've already seen that several times. So we need to make a distinction here in, in the language. Look back in chapter 2 uh, that we went through a few weeks ago in verse 5. Uh, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. There he says, I'm going to come to you quickly, but it's for judgment. Uh, in verse 16, uh, to another church, he says there in chapter 2, Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Uh, but we see different, a different language here. Uh, I come to you quickly and I am coming quickly are really two very distinctive phrases. Uh, look on over in chapter 22, verse 7. There he says, Behold, I am coming quickly, like we have in our text. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this, this prophecy. Uh, every time that Jesus is saying he's coming in judgment, he always says, I am coming to you quickly. And it's, it's for judgment. Every time he mentions he's coming and it's meant to be an encouragement, a word of comfort, it's I am coming quickly. Uh, it seems like a small thing, but it's a very important uh, comparison. Uh, and again, look how the, uh, the idea that the, uh, the rapture takes place in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Now, again, when, as we've said before, when Jesus says, I'm coming quickly, uh, it, um, what it means is that when he comes, these events will happen quickly. They will, they will, they will go down in rapid succession uh, in, in, the, in, the, in terms of, say, 2,000 years of, of the history of the church. Compared to that time, compared to when, when Jesus comes for the church in terms of the rapture of the church and the events of the tribulation, it's quick. I'm coming for you quickly. So it's talking about an order of events that happened rapid. Do you ever set, set dominoes up when you were a kid or watch those guys that are really good at it and have the little bridges and the tunnels and all that? It's like they have to be so, <laughs> so careful, right? Because if you bump one, one starts to drop, it's just da -da 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 -da, and you can't stop it. That's what Jesus is talking about here. It's like, I'm coming quickly. It's not that, well, man, it's been 2,000 years. It has been. And it compared to that, to these events, it's very, it's very rapid uh, and it's very quick. Look at what Paul says about the rapture. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound... And the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. How quick is it? A twinkling of an eye. Not a blink of an eye, a twinkling of an eye. That's pretty rapid. That's pretty, uh, pretty quick. So, again, what's, what's the challenge here? Well, however long until the rapture, when it happens, it'll be too late. Yeah, no, there, there won't be a great anticipation. There won't be a... I just feel it in my bones. The rapture is happening in a week. So I've got a week to, in a sense, get my house in order. I'm going to go out and share with everybody I've always wanted to share with. I'm going to do this. And all the things that I've wanted to the Lord, because I could just feel it. It's, it's not going to happen like that. <laughs> it's just, we're gone. We're just, it's just quick. And then all these events just rattle off like dominoes dropping. That's, that's the challenge. A lot of things that Jesus is giving as an encouragement, but there's a real challenge. It's like, here's all these things. I've set an open door for you. And uh, what I've opened, there, there, yeah, there's going to be adversaries, but you can go through it and no one will stop you. No one can, can, can shut a door that I've opened in terms of a, a culture, a people, whoever you're trying to reach, someone you're trying to reach uh, with, with the gospel. Certainly, we need to pray that the Lord would open the doors of people's hearts individually that we're trying to reach, but that he would open other doors as well. But I can just tell you what's going on in the world today is unprecedented in terms of the gospel going out and the number of people that are coming to faith in, uh, in, in Jesus Christ. And just the, the ministry that I mentioned with Gospel for Asia uh, in India and in Asia is unprecedented in terms of the number of full-time workers and the results that they're they're seeing. Every time we hear the numbers and the reports, it's just 
mind-boggling uh, the number of people that are in, in the hundreds of thousands that are coming to faith uh, in Jesus Christ. It's an open door, but there's a challenge because it's a limited time because the Lord's coming quickly. The second challenge, he challenges us by saying to hold fast what you have. Now, he stated that back in uh, chapter 2 and verse 13, uh, then again in, in verse 25, uh, then in verse 3 of chapter 3. And we talked about this idea. It talks about dedication and loyalty is being urged. Uh, again, this idea, we might change the name, hold fast to what you have, is, is uh, are you committed or how committed are you? In this case, it's to the word of God. Listen to what John says in 1 John 2, 28. And now, little children, abide in me, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practice, practices righteousness is born of him. He's coming quickly. When he appears, we want to have confidence and not be ashamed at his coming. How will we do that? By holding fast to, to what we have. And certainly we have the word of God. We've got the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and really that's, uh, that's all that we need. So there's a communication of his message that's very important. He seeks to give them courage. Uh, there's a challenge to be committed. And the fourth thing, as in the other churches, there's a promise of eternal compensation. And, there's, um, and again, all of these have just been uh, in, incredible. But, uh, and they're all kind of interesting, too, because they're all, they're all metaphors, and you've got to kind of think them through uh, a, a little bit. Uh, but the compensation, the first one is compared to a pillar uh, in, in the temple. By the way, will there be, will there be a temple? No, the, uh, the light of, and the glory of God and of, of Jesus Christ, that's the temple. And uh, so it, it, this, is a, this is a metaphor. But uh, verse 12, I will make him a pillar in my temple and he shall, not, he shall go out no more. Uh, and again, in the, in the Greek, it's a double negative, which we would never say in English, but it's said for effect. In other words, he's saying, you shall never... No way, no how, go out, ever, never, again. That's a lot of security. <laughs> when you, you come into a relationship with me, and what I have for you in the future in terms of being with me in my temple, you're like a pillar, and it's not going anywhere, or the whole thing's going to fall down. You're like a pillar, and once you're there, you're never, no how, no way, ever going to be separated, go out from me ever again, literally is what's, uh, uh, what's being said here. And, uh, and again, it's meant to bring security to us. Uh, again, we're not really apt to share our salvation with someone else if we're not even sure of it ourselves. I really want you to know Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not really sure if I know him for sure, but I sure like you to, you know, if he's asking us to go and share the gospel with the world, he also wants to make sure that, that we know that our eternal compensation is secured in what he has done for us and not anything that uh, we could ever do uh, for him. Uh, and then the second one is um, very interesting. The compensation is, uh, includes revealing new names. Uh, and, and he goes through a, a whole, this whole list of uh, this idea of, of names and, and new names. And, and there's a couple of other times it's mentioned in the book as well. In, in chapter 14, verse 1, uh, John says, There I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him a 144,000, we've mentioned those, saying, his father's name written on their foreheads. Uh, later in chapter 19, of verse 13, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Uh, chapter 22, verse 4, they shall see his face and his name shall be on their, their foreheads. Uh, so what, what is with all of this as far as his writing his names on us? Well, I do think it's interesting that the, uh, again, during the tribulation period, the Antichrist, when he is able to take over and have a one world religious system and a one world government that uh, controls everything, uh, you will need a uh, uh, basically, in a sense, his name written on you if you're going to buy and sell. And, and um, we used to s speculate as to what that might be, and, but now we don't speculate anymore because we've already developed a com computer chip that holds all of your business records and everything else and your dental records and everything, and it can be inserted. And, and they've already test marketed in, uh, in many areas to find out that it worked, and it's going to take care of a big issue 
called personal identity fraud. Has anyone ever heard of that before? Uh, did you hear that, about that 20 years ago? That, that wasn't an issue, was it? But all this is moving us very rapidly towards this time where uh, the Antichrist is going to put his name on people that are always imitating what God's uh, going to do. Somebody asked me, he says, well, are you, Tim, are you ever going get to get a tattoo? I say, yeah, in heaven. I'm going to get his name written on me. I'm kind of waiting for that one. Now, I don't know if we're literally going to get it, uh, a name across our forehead, but the whole point is, in heaven, God will give us a new identity. That's the idea. Uh, you know, we're, we're really known by, by our names, you know. Hey, do you know so-and-so? Yeah, I know them. You know, I mean, you know, it's like, say the name. It's an identity with that person, their behavior, their past, you know, their character and everything else. But uh, when we get to heaven, we're going to have a new name, and it's going to be a name that God gives us not somebody else, not what somebody else says our name should be or what somebody else says uh, should be said about us or written about us or that we're literally stuck with because of something we've done uh, in the past. It'll be a complete new identity and we'll be secure in that identity because we're like pillars in a, in a temple. Again, all of these future compensations, what a great uh, devotion just to kind of you know, from time to time, you know, to go back over those in, uh, in, in your Bible. But uh, again, all speaking about the, the love that God has for us. Uh, Philip Bliss, I was, looking for a, I was looking for a hymn that I couldn't find, and I came across this one, and I wanted to read some of the uh, lyrics. And as I was reading the lyrics and going over the chorus, I realized that, oh, well, this is one of my dad's fav favorite hymns here. He used to sing it when he was a, a young guy in a quartet, which was a rock band at the time. And... Uh, <laughs> In his era, and they would go out on the streets and sing four-part harmony, draw big crowds, and then uh, preach the gospel. But uh, so my dad at 80, really in his day, was a rocker. So uh, this was one of the, the songs that he would sing. Great lyrics, Philip Bliss, Jesus Loves Even Me. Uh, I'm so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms I do flee whenever I remember that Jesus loves me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great king, this shall be my song through eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. If one should ask of me, how can I tell? Glory to Jesus, I know very well. God's Holy Spirit with mine doth agree, constantly witnessing Jesus loves me. In this assurance, I find sweetest rest. Trusting in Jesus, I know I am blessed. Satan dismayed from my soul now doth flee when I just tell him that Jesus loves me. Thank you. 